Good almost afternoon, everyone. We're just letting people join in and we'll get started in just a few minutes. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our session today. My name is Zicky Ellingrod, and I'm the Senior Associate Dean in the College of Pharmacy, as well as the Education Lead for University of Michigan Precision Health. Before we get started today, I wanted to say a few words about Precision Health and what we're trying to do with this webinar series. Today is our third webinar in an educational series that's designed to co connect clinicians and healthcare professionals with concepts key to understanding the role of a learning health science, artificial intelligence, and machine learning in clinical care. The overall series title is called Demystifying the Data, Process, and Tools that are Changing Clinical Care. The series was developed in collaboration with Dr. Cornelius James, who's one of our panelists today, as well as the Precision Health Education Workgroup members. This webinar series is gonna culminate in a symposium that will be taking place on March 16th. And we hope that that symposium will be able to be a face-to-face -face event. So please save that date. We also invite you to mark your calendar for another great webinar next month. You won't wanna miss this one as we'll hear from Nicholson Price from the U of M Law School and Abigail Jones from our College of Liberal Arts and Sciences regarding important ethical and legal aspects of artificial intelligence and machine learning and clinical practice. That webinar is going to take place on Thursday, January 27th at 1.30 p.m. So look out for the email registration for that. Before we begin with our panelists today, I wanted to provide you with some information about Precision Health in case you're not familiar. We are focused on improving and advancing discovery, treatment, and health. With those objectives in mind, over the last three years, Precision Health has built new and innovative infrastructure that supports interdisciplinary research across the entire U of M campus. If this is something that interests you, I highly recommend that you become familiar with our analytics platform, which was developed to help researchers from all disciplines and at all levels access and use Precision Health data. We also have unique data sets that can enrich many research projects involving health, health and health precision health research. Yet we all know that research that doesn't make its way into, into the clinic cannot improve people's health. So precision health realizes the importance of translating its findings into practice. The precision health implementation work group has been doing just that with recent research findings on such health issues such as C. diff, mental health, and COVID-19. In addition, each year we provide the U of M community and others opportunities to learn more about Precision Health through webinars like this one, symposium that I already talked about, and more recently, our first in the nation Precision Health Certificate Program. This program is open to all graduate and professional students across the U of M campus. We are currently enrolling students into the program for the winter semester and applications are due December 12th, so there's still time to apply. If you're interested in more information uh, about Precision Health and in particular the certif certificate, other resources or programming, you can find all the information that you're looking for on our website. We also invite you to become a Precision Health member. We have almost 250 members now and every member is able to use our resources get communication uh, and support in publicizing their research um, and enjoy other benefits. So we invite you to visit the Precision Health website today and apply. Now on for our webinar today. Today's event is gonna be a panel discussion and the topic is what clinicians need to know when using artificial intelligence 
and machine learning driven technologies in medical decision making. Our format today is gonna to be very informal as I will pose questions to our panelists. If you have any questions that you would like for me to ask the panelists, please submit them through the Q&A box anytime during the webinar and we will try to address them during the webinar or after. Today, we are honored to welcome four panelists, each of whom have a unique perspective on this topic. I'm gonna to start by asking each of them to introduce themselves and to say a few words about how this topic affects their work or their field of study. Joining me today is uh, Dr. Rada uh, Michaela, um, Dr. Max Spadafor, Dr. Cornelius James, and the soon-to-be Dr. Erkin Ockels, um, who is uh, currently uh, in our MSTP um, program. And so to start off, I would like to ask each of you to uh, show your video and introduce yourself and tell us how you, current, how you are currently working in the machine learning artificial intelligence space. And I think that um, I'm gonna start off with Rada. Thanks, Vicky, and hi, everyone. I'm Rada Mihalcha. I'm a professor of computer science I'm here in Michigan, and I also direct the AI lab. And um, I've been interested in AI for a long time. Uh, my main area of expertise is natural language processing. Um, and within that, I've been exploring both the fundamentals of natural language processing, um, also applications of NLP to other um, areas, um, including a focus of mine and interest um, has been healthcare, how NLP can be used in, in healthcare. And I've been having the pleasure of interacting with people on this call and other people in, in this space. Great, thank you. Uh, Cornelius, I'm gonna have you go next. Uh, thank you, Vicky, uh, and uh, welcome everyone. I really appreciate the uh, opportunity uh, that Precision Health has offered uh, for me to be here speaking with you all about my perspective related to artificial intelligence and machine learning and healthcare. And I also appreciate the opportunity to be uh, on the panel uh, with all of these great thinkers. So I I'm an assistant professor in internal medicine and pediatrics here at the University of Michigan. I am uh, an internist and a pediatrician by training. I work predominantly as a clinician educator. I direct the evidence-based medicine curriculum uh, at the University of Michigan Medical School and uh, direct uh, the, or am one of the co-leads for the evidence-based medicine curriculum for the internal medicine residency program. And um, more recently, I've uh, spent a lot of time thinking about uh, clinical reasoning, medical decision-making, and the role that artificial intelligence and machine learning will play uh, in uh, clinicians' clinical reasoning and, and decision-making. And, and with that, I'm currently working on developing curricula uh, related to artificial intelligence and machine learning in healthcare. And uh, as Rada said, I've had the opportunity to work with many of the people on this call and look forward to chatting with you guys more today. Great, thank you. Erkin, I think I'll have you go next. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Erkin Oatless. I'm a uh, MD PhD student here um, at Michigan. And I'm actually co advised by Dr. Brian Dunton, uh, who's in industrial engineering, and uh, Dr. Jenna Weems, who is in computer science. My research um, really focuses on how do we take machine learning models that we might be developing sort of in the research space or even industrial spaces and um, start using them, uh, prospectively implementing them into either the EHR or various other settings, and then figure out you know, what can go wrong once we start implementing them, and then also try to understand what's the proper interface in terms of serving these models to physicians or other clinicians. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Great, thank you so much. And then Max, let's hear it up. Um, hey, everybody. My name is Max. I'm a second year resident in the Department of Emergency Medicine. Um, graduated from the University of Michigan Medical School uh, a couple of years ago. Um, so my work focuses primarily on using machine learning um, and, and, and particularly natural language processing actually in the medical education space. Um, so I'm very interested in how um, artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning um, is going to affect our learners as we progress into a, a more, um, more machine learning dominated future. 
um, and in particular, how we can use um, NLP to our advantage rather than our detriment to um, help evaluate and uh, provide feedback to learners. Um, and then I'm also interested in um, how um, machine learning natural language processing can further or reduce uh, bias uh, in the clinical space and in the medical education space. Great, thank you all. Uh, so our second question is more for Max and Irvin. So um, you're currently in a, in a training role um, and you're coming out of you know, medical programs that didn't really have a strong presence um, in learning about AI and machine learning. So how did you initially get involved um, in either AI or machine learning? Um, gosh, I feel like everyone has their like origin story when it comes to this. That's the interesting part. Um, and it's I always actually, an origin story too. Yeah, and I, I, it's like, I think that's like part of the problem actually is like, you know, I, I had been interested in computers for a really long time, had like, you know, learned programming when I was young. Um, and then I got to, I got to undergrad and I was like, well, I'm interested in medicine. I'm interested in computer science. I'm going to have to pick between the two. And like, turns out you don't really have to pick. Um, and it turns out that they're kind of like slowly becoming the same thing. Um, but I think that's sort of part of part of the like, and I got involved in research and like first like biosignals processing, and then I moved into med ed once I got to med school. Um, but I think that's kind of part of the problem is like the way like everyone who works in this field right now is like, ooh, I had this like origin story where somehow I got like dumped into it or like found my way into it, rather than like this was part of my curriculum and I became literate in it. And then I decided to become more interested in it beyond that. I think that's something we need to change going forward. I, um, I really love the, the origin story. Um, so my, my origin story, and uh, sometimes if, you know, if uh, anyone's interested and they want to buy me a beer, I'll tell, the, I'll tell everyone like the full, like, you know, circling the drain origin story, but the sort of shorter version um, is that I, uh, I was like Max interested in medicine and computers for a very long time. And in my undergrad, I was like, well, I'm, I'm, I think I'm more interested in um, sort of the computational side of uh, medicine. So I'm gonna go work for an EHR vendor who we won't name here. Um, and um, while I was there, I was struck with um, sort of the, the, the fact that like, despite working on like an extremely complicated system, potentially like needlessly complicated, um, really what it was was like a dumb information storage and retrieval system. And we, we had the opportunity, right? We had so much information, so much data, and it, you know, there's all kinds of problems with it being noisy, um, incomplete, biased, but just despite all those facts, a lot of data, um, but we're not, we weren't really using it in, you know, an intelligent way, at least at the time. And it didn't look like we had a lot of plans um, from the vendor that I was working for to like really make, um, bring a lot of value back out of that data. And so I, I started thinking about it. Um, and then it sort of led me down, you know, let me train more on this. And then I realized, you know, I think you really need to understand how physicians think in order to actually understand how to build proper models and tools and implement them. And so, um, luckily, the, the people here at the, um, the medical scientist training program sort of took a chance on me, um, a little bit of an untraditional candidate, and they were like, we see, we see this direction and we're willing to sort of, you know, uh, go down this, way, just this route with you. And it's been very fulfilling um, because Michigan really, I think, is like one of the best places where um, not a lot of places even now fully get it. And um, you see the, the College of Engineering and other people, School of Information, uh, LSA, uh, all sort of stitching together with the med school with the idea that, you know, there is, there's value here and there's really cool research, really cool application. Um, and so it's just been, it's been cool to see this like grow over time from the, the perspective that I sort of started out at with the, um, with the EHR vendor. Uh, Vicky, could I just kind of piggyback on that, on what uh, Ergen just said? I, I think he makes an amazing point when it comes to what the University of Michigan, in my opinion, is primed to do as a medical educator when it comes to bringing these interdisciplinary teams or these multidisciplinary multi teams together. U of M is just so strong in so many areas, whether it's medicine, engineering, law, and so on. And I think we, we're primed uh, to uh, really take the lead with respect to some of the things that are going on uh, with respect to artificial intelligence and machine learning. 
there's actually a pharmacy group that I'm aware of as well, pharmacy informatics group that is working, I know, with a, a lot of investigators and, and clinicians uh, in, the med in the medical school. Um, so you, you all are making it sound like you're uh, some, a bit of a unicorn here. Um, and I, I hope that's not really the case, but how often are you hearing students, fellows, residents, or practicing clinicians really talking about, um, you know, kind of using the, the AI or machine learning in clinical settings? And, and hopefully they're, they're in a positive way, because I know there's a lot of frustration with the science. Um, I mean, you hear about it a lot. Like, I think there's a difference between the, like, I think, like they're like sort of the recipients who are like subjugated, that's a bad word, but like a little bit harsh uh, by these systems. And then they're like those who are trying to like sort of own the systems. Um, and there's a lot fewer owners than, than subjects to these systems. And, and I think, you know, the vast majority of feedback that I hear from the problem with the problem with all these systems is that when they work, no one, like you never hear anything good about them because they just work. Um, and when they don't work, you definitely hear about it. And there are some truly terrible systems out there um, that, that were not terrible in the lab, um, were great in the lab, but in implementation, uh, much to Ergen's, you know, his whole area of research, it is so much harder to make these things work well. Um, and so I think there's a growing group um, of, of sort of owner, I think like, you know, um, with every like sort of generation of, of learners, you get more and more, um, but it's still a small minority right now um, because in the past it was such a disparate set of skills and luckily it's becoming more and more, like that's what we need to do is make them sort of the same, same set of competencies. Yeah, I think like to Max's point, my, my measure of that like increasing is actually, um, and I'm sure, you know, uh, Max and Dr. James has had this sort of experience um, where like someone comes up to you and sit there at the beginning of their journey, right? So they're like, their origin story is like really in sort of the, the seedling stage. And so you have someone that's interested in me like med school and maybe um, they have some interest in computer science, but then they're trying to make a decision about if they should do med school. And I've had, um, I don't have a, a formal tally, but I think the number of people that approached me um, with this sort of dual interest has actually increased over time. And that's been really nice to see is that um, people really do view this as like an opportunity and there's that there's compatibility there as opposed to like, I have to choose one or the other. Um, so I think, you know, that's, that's promising because in terms of like the trainees, the number of trainees, I think that's going to be increasing the number of uh, MSCP or MD, PhD fellows that are interested in this space. Um, are also increasing. And then I think, um, you know, uh, from my time on clinic, you get very interesting, you know, I would tell people, hey, I'm interested in this. And I wasn't in my research phase yet, but I'd still get very interesting feedback in terms of, hey, you know, we have the system and it, it just sort of like sucks. And oftentimes it was, you know, sometimes it would be like, it would be like this sucks in relation to like the EHR system. And I, I'm very happy to take some of the brunt of the burden on that because, um, I had a small role in that, um, but the AI systems that people are interested in weren't really like fully being used at, and some, you know, we have some smaller ones that are sort of coming into usage, but a lot of the questions that were coming to me or discussions were like, hey, wouldn't it be great if we had X or Y? And it's, you know, the surgeon that while we're like scrubbing in for a case was like, hey, I, you know, I had a patient that had, you know, this like, this like weird clotting condition just sort of occurred. And it's something that I could have been on the lookout for, but because of my like surgical caseload, it's not something that I'm like actively monitoring my patients for. Why don't we have this like as a system that's built into the EHR? And so I think the more and more that we have these types of discussions and they don't have to be like, they don't have to be fully formed. Like I have the model for it, I have the data for it, but like, I know that this could be something that we could do. Can I find the right person in the system to help be a champion to actually build it, to be the owner, as uh, Max said, and then to have people view um, not like ownership of like building the thing, but ownership as in like, this is a tool that I use and I, um, I will like to get feedback on it and I'd like it to improve. I think that's like a big cultural change that I'm excited to happen um, in medicine over the future. Great, thanks. Um, Cornelius, I'm gonna turn this over to you and, and ask you a 
question and say, you know, I know you're doing a lot of work in educating healthcare providers and and um, what what's kind of happening in that space about changing curriculum so that our, our up and coming learners are, are, you know, able to advance the science even further. Yeah, thanks for that question, Vicki. I, I definitely think that uh, the movement is kind of underway to some extent. There's there's small pockets around the country that have began to kind of sound the trumpet and say that we need to begin to uh, educate our learners across the medical education continuum with respect to artificial intelligence and machine learning. But we are still very much in the beginning. And, 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 I, and I would say, you know, even just in my clinical practice or you know, speaking with my colleagues, um, I, I would say that I don't think we're having these conversations enough uh, to, to some extent. And, and the same is true even, and, and I've stated uh, previously that I, I have roles within medical education across the continuum. And, and, and that's allowed me to kind of appreciate where we are to some extent when it comes to how frequently we're talking about this and, how, uh, and more specifically, how frequently we're talking about the impact that this is going to have on what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So there have been organizations, the um, AMA, the AAMC, the National Academy of Medicine, those organizations have been pushing for uh, education in this space, but I think we are still um, fairly early. There are some universities that have actually started to put some things in place when it comes to medical education, but those curricula, tend, they're, they're, while, while they're great, they, they tend to be more geared toward, this is what artificial intelligence and machine learning in healthcare is, but there's not that, how is this going to impact what I need to do, what I'm going to do? What do I need to know about this to be an effective practicing physician uh, now to some extent and, and in the future? So it, it, we're still not uh, where we need to be, not quite where we need to be, but my team is uh, working on this. But when it comes to uh, developing learning objectives, competencies related to uh, this topic, we're still working on that. And, and I'm speaking with people um, around the country uh, as we talk about, you know, what do our residents, what do our medical students, what do our practicing physicians need to know about this? You know, we are starting to see, I was reviewing the uh, National Board of Medical Examiners subject, uh, health system science subject exam fairly recently, and I was happy uh, and excited, but a little bit surprised to see that there was some artificial intelligence and machine learning content. There were some questions that are related to it. Uh, so, so that was exciting, and I, I do anticipate that as we see more of that, where we're seeing it in things like, you know, certification exams and licensing licensing exams and so on, I, I think that momentum is going to certainly pick up because medical schools, students, residents are going to want to know what they need to know in order to uh, be successful on those exams and, and ultimately uh, practice medicine competently. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. Uh, this is where curriculums are preparing people to take their, their exams. So I'm going to switch a little bit and in turn focus my attention on Rana now. Um, and so most of your work um, is really in natural language processing. And I myself am, am not a researcher in this space. I would be hard pressed to say I'm, I'm a clinician anymore. So could you provide a brief summary of, of what natural language processing is? And if there's maybe a uh, well-known application or something in clinical practice that you could use as an example, that would be really helpful. Sure. Um, so we pretty much see natural language processing everywhere, although to Max's point that you only hear when things go wrong, you may not always know that there is an NLP behind the scenes. Um, very shortly is whatever we do with language programmatically, so computational models that would handle language like English or Chinese or Spanish. Um, and it's going all the way from building the basic models, for instance, one of the main things that are being explored in this field is how to create representation of words, sort of the fundamental piece in some languages, not all languages use individual words. Um, and you may have heard of word embeddings or word vectors. So that's um, one thing that's of interest. Um, it's also looking at relations between words, how to represent entire documents. So pretty much the entire space around language and how to represent and use language computationally. And there are a lot of um, applications of NLP. It's not in healthcare, but I always like to bring up the um, application of spam checking, which is something that we all use on a daily basis. And again, we don't necessarily realize it. 
uh, but is there behind the scene doing classification on the fly for every email that hits our inbox, figuring out whether it should go to the spam box or to our sort of real active inbox. And that is an instance of natural language processing. Um, in the space of healthcare, I think we often hear about electronic health records, which is not necessarily something that is in place or widely used, like using NLP for electronic health records. Uh, but I think that's the more common example that I hear from practitioners in terms of, oh, if there would be some NLP, it would be so cool to apply it on electronic health records. Um, I think something that is, I see it being used and deployed um, is online in terms of organization of healthcare information. If you look for um, information on Google, for instance, medical information, you will see different boxes that would appear with information on that. That's again, due to a natural language processing that tries to figure out what are you looking for and then provides some relevant information that one can explore. Uh, and there is much more, but I'm, I'm happy to touch on it later um, in our conversation. You know, I, as a follow-up question, um, you know, you, you brought up the idea of spam, and I think that that gets to the point where um, we, these are machine. I mean, it's machine learning, and it needs to learn. And so, you know, I'm horrible at checking my spam, but when I do, and I find messages in there that I do not want that are not spam, I have to teach it what to do. So I think that that's really important to realize that when we're seeing um, these issues that are being brought up, that it's really us humans have not taught the, the machine um, what it needs to know. So is that part of like, it's kind of an iterative process and kind of implementing some of the natural language processing? It is, um, I, I would say it's not necessarily personalized, um, although it's, in the sense that it is to some extent personalized. So it is iterative. If you look at spam detectors, say 10 years ago, they were so much worse than what we have now. And that's primarily because in the time between then and now, um, we got a lot more data, which has been sort of labeled for whether it's spam or not, which then the machines would use to learn more. And so they are just getting better over time because of that. Um, there is also some attempt to try to learn more like I wouldn't necessarily call them personalized decision. I think the amount of data that you, for instance, Vicky, have, it's not enough for a machine to pick on, oh, what should have been actually in her inbox, not spam. They do ask you to label it as such, right? If there is something in spam, they will say, oh, if it's not spam, then indicate. And then they would use that to retrain the models. But it's not necessarily that one individual example that you pointed out to, but rather a collection of such examples from many people that will get the systems. Um, better. And ultimately, I think for those to work, it will be a combination. So these are sort of the learning systems, which can cover most of the ground, which can be combined with some sort of good old rule-based systems, right? So you could put the filter in place and indicate, well, this should never go to spam. And that would make it more applicable. I think there is always a question of trade-off, right? So I'm also getting upset when I see an email that should have been in my inbox and it's spam and I missed it. But then when I think, would I pay the price of having all that spam in my inbox instead? Maybe not. So um, yeah, that's that's that. Sorry. Great answer. You know, and I think I'm gonna uh, open this up to all the panelists and kind of take this a step further. You know, what can we do to begin demystifying some of the artificial intelligence in healthcare? And I, you know, I think that, what you just said about the trade-offs is really important. And I think about, you know, alert fatigue versus missing something really important. Um, and so thoughts about how we can, how we can start to uh, work to demystify other than doing webinars and panels uh, such as this one. So beyond that. So uh, I'll just start with um, maybe something uh, that the, the audience might find obvious, but I think it, it bears repeating um, if it is obvious. Uh, and the, the first thing that I think about is these are engineered systems, right? This is not like artificial intelligence, machine learning is not magic. It's not like we waved a magic wand and it's perfect, right? It's gonna solve all your problems. It, it really is 
Um, there's a lot of engineering work that goes into it. There's some theory, there's a lot of coding, there's a lot of data, you know, processing. And in all of those steps, there's a lot of assumptions that are made. And there's a lot of values that are baked in, in terms of, you know, what's the appropriate amount of like false positives or false negatives, or what, what performance characteristics do we want, or how is this going to be used? So all of those are assumptions that are baked into the system. And those assumptions will affect how users perceive the system. So if they start to say, well, you know, um, this isn't working for my case, or it's really missing a lot of patients that I really would want it to flag. Um, you know, people should feel empowered to say this engineered system isn't working well for me. I need to go back and talk to the engineers or need to talk to the developers and I need to figure out, like we need to figure out a way to make it better. So it's not like, it's not someone that had the right answers and they were doing it the right way from the get go. But if we can view it as an engineering process with iterations, I think, we'll be able to get to a place where if the systems aren't good today, we can get to better systems tomorrow. Um, and that's sort of like the, the, I think the very first thing, if we can set that expectation with clinicians, um, that could probably move the needle a, a fair bit. And, and I will agree with uh, everything that Erkin just stated, but, but I'm gonna also just add to that, uh, that I think that sometimes like, especially as we talk about assumptions, we can to some extent kind of assume that clinicians know the language, right? Or the lingo, or they know what to look for. So I, I think that there definitely has to be, uh, and I, I uh, acknowledge my bias given that I'm a medical educator, um, but I, I think that we have to make sure that clinicians are equipped and empowered uh, to uh, A, recognize or identify when uh, there are potential issues related to the output of a machine learning model, but to also be able to articulate and to uh, describe and explain the concerns that they have in a mutually agreed upon language with those engineers and computer scientists and so on. So I think that's another important important uh, layer to it. I think, I, th I think a lot of this um, has to be around, um, like just like Eric and, and, and Dr. James said, um, reframing how these, are, how these are sort of pitched and described to clinicians, um, which is that um, these are, you know, it, it, they need to be used like tests, like a CT scan that I order in the department for somebody who comes in with belly pain. It is like a weapon to be deployed at a time in a circumstance. Um, and the problem is that these things have often been pitched as like either here is something that's being implemented for everyone all the time. It's going to give you feedback and you need to like decide what to do with it. Um, or it's been like, here's a magic bullet that is going to work on everyone all the time. And there's no like dichotomy, which is that like CT scans like with contrast don't work very well on people who have low levels of abdominal fat. And you know, if you're not doing oral contrast, then you're gonna have a bad, you're gonna have trouble doing 3D reconstruction for your IVD patients. And like these things are so nuanced. Um, and we treat them like they should be like the single step thing. And, and that's where like Dr. James gets into it without education into how these systems work and a unification of the language that clinicians and engineers can use to talk about these things, you'll never get there. But I think the, sort of the first step, other than like building curricula into schools as to how to learn this language, is to stop pitching these things as like God-like systems that just like exist in the ether and more like, this is a clinical test that you can choose, as, uh, that you choose or deploy or interpret as part of your standard medical decision-making when you see a patient. I could add just briefly, um, I've heard recently in a different context, we were talking about um, AI and um, in general flying automation, so quite different. And there I've heard of this concept of automation surprise, uh, which apparently it is a big issue when um, for pilots. Uh, when Because right now there is, I wouldn't necessarily call it AI, but there is some automation that's happening, right? So there is the autopilot for airplanes and, in critical situations when these autopilots will hand over to the human pilot, the human pilot is sort of lost because they don't know how we got there in the first place, what to do. Even if they have the, the knowledge, um, they wouldn't know how to handle that particular situation because of that, presumably it's, it's known as automation surprise. And I would see the same here as we start adopting more and more um, AI systems, how there could be this kind of automation surprise 
where you get to a point where the system will hand it over to the clinician and say, now do something, I don't know what to do. And the clinician wouldn't know, like, how do we even got here? And what was brought up in that conversation, which is really what's mentioned here, there is need for, I wouldn't say necessarily full training because we cannot be experts at everything, but some basic concepts of understanding how a system works, that it learns from data, that like how in general it works. So you understand how you got in a certain situation using a system. And then there is the other part, which was also highlighted before. So this is primarily for clinician, but it's also for adoption by the public. And I think that's really important to communicate with the public. Like we do now, even like reaching out to communities, um, because I could see given the disfavor that the media does by creating all this hype around AI and showing all these systems that we see in movies that sort of often go astray, people start to fear AI, which is wrong because we are really not at that point. So communicating about what AI is and what are the limits and what are the positive implications of all that, I think it's very important also beyond clinicians, like for the patients, like for everyone who would be using or being impacted by these systems. Um, so I see we have two questions from, our, from the audience, which I'm gonna to get to after I ask this next question to you all. Um, but there's been a lot of literature published recently about algorithms potentially perpetuating or even worsening some biases in healthcare. Um, is this something clinicians that use these tools should be concerned about? Um, and is there like how should how should clinicians approach this when they're being um, you know um, interfacing with machine learning or AI? I can perhaps start. Um, I think it's true that the machines are perpetuating the biases. So we had those in a way. I mean, not to justify them, but it's a way of functioning in the world. Like we create stereotypes as a way of generalizing. And many such stereotypes are wrong, but we are just it's sort of hardwired in our nature to try to navigate the world. Um, and so a lot of the data that's out there that we use to train these systems actually has those biases in there. And so systems will train that. Now this said, given awareness of these biases, we do have an opportunity to fix them. So we do not have to replicate them with systems, but rather fix them. And I think that's actually a great opportunity because I feel, I mean, as hard as I try, I think I'm, I still have implicit biases. I still function the way, I don't know, if I find myself at night somewhere, I would make some judgments around me, depending on who's approaching me. And that's sort of almost survival. But then with the system, if we know that's there and we fix it, then we can almost sort of surpass our own limitations. It's not gonna be easy. I think jury is still out there what it means to fix those biases and how to do it. Uh, but in a way, I would see it mostly as an opportunity rather than a limitation that AI would have. Yeah, um, I think, you know, I think this comes, um, again, the reframing these systems as like clinical tests to use in certain circumstances is like another, like, for example, the glomerular filtration rate, right, which is a, a measure of kidney function, um, is, uh, it's impossible to measure like in a one-off, just like single test that you get from your blood. And like, that makes it completely useless in like a short-term situation. So they did a lot of studies in the past in like the seventies, which like whenever you say something happened in the seventies, it's already gonna be biased. And, um, and so essentially they like built these equations where they can take an easy to detect single like number measure of kidney function and like extrapolate it out to this glomerular filtration rate, which is like the, gold standard for like how medications are cleared and like how well the kidney is actually functioning. And, um, and so the, 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 the equations are of course biased. They actually split it out. The standard way is to go by like black and then non-black. And like, it turns out that like, there's not any real difference that's backing that up. And uh, it actually like ends up holding black people back from um, kidney transplant. Um, and so it, um, the university is actually switching away from using that like dichotomy over the next, um, uh, like I think like in the new year or something like that, right? Finally, after like four years. And so um, like 
the machine, like machine learning algorithms suffer from the same thing. They are just a fancier version of that equation. Um, and instead of feeding them a few hundred people's kidney function analyses, we feed them like the entire internet. And uh, the internet is horrible. And so they learn from that. Um, and learn is a strong word. They develop their equations based on that. Um, and so, you know, a classic finding is like, you know, these word embeddings that, uh, that, that I was talking about, um, they learn from reading books essentially. And so you can type in like man is to physician and it'll give you the output of the analogy and it'll say woman is to homemaker. And that's because of the trillion books it read, you know, the word woman appears next to homemaker more than, you know, more than not, because it's looking at books from years and years ago. And so, um, and so these, these, it, it, what it ends up doing is perpetuating the bias. It doesn't know what it's doing. It's unbelievably dumb. Artificial intelligence is a strong word when it comes to these systems um, and it just perpetuates the bias. The problem is that it requires human intervention and caution and monitoring to avoid per perpetuating the bias. Often a lot of work, a lot of work. And we are bad at doing work. Um, and so it's, uh, it's risky from that perspective. Um, and uh, I have a very, personally have a very, very, very high threshold of skepticism for these systems um, because they just, uh, they have such potential, they can do their bias so much faster than humans can um, and risk perpetuating it more strongly. To, to follow up on, on your answer, um, there was a question about concerns about underlying data that are used to build AI systems because we know that um, the majority of the data that's collected are on minor majority populations and don't necessarily include minority populations. So um, I think that kind of, you know, builds that or, you know, kind of is, is part of what your answer was that you need to be aware of where the the data is coming from and what are some of the limitations of the data that you're using to then build your models um, so that you can um, either know the limitations of the models or work to build models that are reducing a lot of those uh, limitations. Um, but again, I'm not, an, I'm not an expert in this space. Um, so if I'm saying something wrong, uh, please um, forgive me. Um, there's one other thing, Eric, if anyone wants to follow up on that. Yeah. I think that's actually a, like um, like really related to the point that I um, that I'm about to bring up, and um, I think understanding how the bias gets into the data is very important because that's one thing that we need to understand in order to see how it will you know percolate through the system to the data to the you know ML system or AI system that's built off the data, and then you know we have to see how it's implemented as well. As well, so there's all kinds of places where. Um, bias can sneak in either through the data or assumptions. Um, so being vigilant is important. And I think we've talked a little bit about vigilance and then the data, looking at the data are very important. And sort of, uh, I think there's a point that's in between the two, which is like being very vigilant in terms of how we assess these systems and being um, extremely uh, picky in terms of looking for bias is gonna be, I think a very important uh, skill and set of analysis that will need to be done for every model that we're using in healthcare. And I, I think we're starting to do it more when we look at papers, people will usually expect now that you report performance of systems on, you know, special subgroups and say, is there a subgroup, um, maybe a, spe a special population that has worse performance for this system that you're proposing. And I think that's like, we should be doing that just sort of like, as a standard operating procedure. Like that's not a question, it's not a nice to have, it's absolutely necessary thing. Um, we should be doing this every time we consider using a new model for our system, we should be analyzing that model to see is there a, a, a subpopulation that we have maybe that when the model was developed, that subpopulation didn't really exist or wasn't even really represented at that center. Um, but we should be looking to see, are we, you know, are we gonna be disadvantaging or harming patients by using this model. So we should be doing that evaluation, hopefully upfront without actually affecting the patient. Sometimes that's not quite possible, but there's ways to construct an experiment to like run the model without affecting patients. So we need more and more of this with more of, and more of an eye to look for, you know, which populations could be affected 
and we're our tools right now are not sophisticated we we're doing very basic stuff like splitting by subpopulations looking at performance i think there's going to be more and more techniques that will need to be developed and we need to have more and more savviness from the physician clinician user side to understand how do i assess if there might be problems with using this model for this subpopulation. Um, just like when we look at evidence-based medicine, um, when we're looking at a randomized controlled trial paper, we'll look at the very first thing is table one. What was the population that this drug was studied in? Is the patient that I'm considering prescribing this drug for even in that population? That's like your first inclusion exclusion criteria. We should be doing this for our models. And that sort of builds off of what Max was saying and then sort of is the vigilance that um, Dr. Michelsea was saying too. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that reference to evidence-based medicine, Erkin, and because I, I was actually doing journal clubs. It's, with it's the all the same thing. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, and that this is why with our curriculum that we're developing, uh, evidence-based medicine, we believe that that is the place to have this in, in, in curricula, uh, not reinventing a AI and machine learning uh, curricula separately from that, but actually having it firmly embedded in uh, an evidence-based medicine curricula. But I was in doing journal club this morning with internal medicine residents. And, and we, we took note of the fact that you, everyone's probably aware of like heart failure preserved ejection fraction. Now we're using, we're saying SGLT2 inhibitors could potentially be effective uh, for patients with heart failure projection, uh, preserved ejection fraction. But we looked at table one. And when we looked at table one, we saw that 70 something percent of participants were, were uh, white. And then there were like 5% black, 3% Asian or something along those lines. So my, my point there is that I think sometimes, like I totally agree with Max that uh, bias or machine artificial intelligence and machine learning can perpetuate that bias on a much greater scale to some extent, or it can. Uh, but at the same time, this is something that we're just seeing in evidence-based medicine or in research generally, when it comes to having representative populations. I think the big issue is that artificial intelligence and machine learning can potentially perpetuate those biases on a much larger scale. Ten minutes left, so I'm going to take three questions and try to put them together. So this is going to be a big one. Um, in your personal interactions, is there resistance from healthcare providers for adopting AI, or are they more excited about it? And what do you think about the possibility of individualizing treatments on a wide scale? Or another way of putting that is, how might we use AI ML to lead to more precise, individualized um, sort of treatments? I can at least get started. I think I'm the least in healthcare from this group. Um, so I can primarily talk about what I've been hearing from people in healthcare. The reluctance seems to be um, not necessarily to AI. Um, at least the collaborators I've been having are very excited and very open to adopting AI and thinking about how it can be used. It's more about actually thinking of the practical issues that come with putting it in practice. So it's one thing to have an algorithm that seems to work well, it's been testing, all the results are good. But when you actually think like, what does that really mean to use it in a hospital or in a doctor's practice? Um, I think those details sometimes fall between the cracks. So I, as a researcher, to be honest, I'm not that interested in that part just because it's not what I've been trained, it's not what excites me. Uh, so I will need another group of people to think through those more, I would almost say pragmatic issues, like what do you do now that you have an algorithm that works, how do you actually apply it in practice? Um, and that part, from what I hear, sometimes seems to be missing. Yeah, I can kind of use sort of a case study to, to illustrate this. Um, uh, our residency also staffs the emergency department at St. Joe's in Ann Arbor, which is more like, it's technically still a tertiary care center, but like compared to the U, everything is a community hospital. So um, so basically community cell medicine, they had this score called the PRISM score. And I, I honestly don't remember what it stands. No one knows because it's so old. And um, they just recently got rid of it. Like literally five days ago, we got an email that said like, no more putting in prison scores because like every time you admitted a patient you had to fill out the prison score you had to go to a separate web interface open the web interface answer like a bunch of questions that are like does your patient have injury question mark and you're like no i don't think no sure and um and then like we calculate the prison score and like it was rated as one to five and 
fives were the least six and ones were like supposed to be on death's door. And um, oftentimes you'd have patients who are, you're like, this guy is unbelievably ill and they get a four and other people just because they were old would get a two. Anyway, either way. Um, and they got rid of it like unceremoniously, just like chop its head off because of the volumes they were seeing in St. Joe's. And they were like, you literally don't have the time to do this because uh, the hospital is burning down. And, um, and I actually, I got really interested in it at that point. So I was like, what is this score? Because no one even knew. And like 12, 10 years ago, um, they developed it and it, it works fantastically. Or at least 12 years ago, it worked fantastically. It's like accuracy or like area under the receiver operating curve for predicting um, mortality at 30 days out was like 88%, like 8.88, like very good. Um, but it's 10 years old. It hasn't been updated in 10 years. It's just been sort of like left to, 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 uh, to rot sort of. Um, as the population patient, you know, the patients I see now are very different from the patients they saw 10 years ago. Um, no one knew what it was for. There were obvious examples in our mind about how it was failing and how it was wrong. And no one ever messaged as to like what it was actually being used for. Um, and so um, in that way, everyone hated it like, like with a passion because um, it was nothing but an extra step that we couldn't feel as the emergency providers added any benefit to the patient or us. And so you, like any, um, that I think is sort of the biggest difference between these systems and the like standard, like clinical testing of old, which is that these systems require constant maintenance. Um, you have to, every 10 years, you have to upgrade your CT scanner because it's old now and you have to spend a few million dollars to fix it but these systems get deployed and they're like, they'll work forever. We don't have to do any more work and they won't. Um, and if you don't like, if, you know, at some point someone at St. Joe's knew the utility of the prison score, but they're like retired now. Um, and so that's, that's where the resistance comes in. When you treat these like magic bullets that will work forever, require no maintenance, no education. They just like, for some reason, like ML and AI, like they, they it got implemented without any caveats at all. And, uh, and so there's natural resistance to it in the sense that there would be resistance to any test that you had to perform on your patients that didn't work very well, um, um, or you didn't know how it worked. Um, and so that's, that's what we have to do to make sure these things are actually, um, uh, are actually used. I think that's a really interesting story because it's it's not um, it's not uncommon, right? It's like it happens everywhere. Every institution has a model like that that's just languishing, um, but it was somehow for some reason like put into fiat that it's part of the workflow. And I think there's this um, there's this problem, and I think maybe some of the res um, resistance that I've seen to these types of systems actually comes from like a socio technical problems. So the fact that people are saying we have this model and now it's going to be part of your workflow and it comes on down from high as sort of like a, a given that like administration or the powers that be or the policies that be say this is like this is a good thing you need to use it and there's not feedback there's not continuous evaluation there's not all the things that we would expect um, from other other parts of the system right like the, even the framework for evaluating these in terms of like QI interventions is not as developed as other as you know, other things that we're deploying in the healthcare system. So I think the um, the hesitancy to these types of systems actually comes from the deployment implementation and like socio technical side as opposed to the technical side. Now I think there's a bunch of issues that should come out from just the technical side too, right? We just talked about bias. That's a big one. Um, you know, also understanding is this even is this even feasible? Is this even something good we should be doing? Like, you know, those ethical concerns are very important as well. Um, but I, I think a lot of the hesitancy comes from, you know, is this is this the are we doing the right thing here in terms of the workflow? And does it affect like my day to day operations? So that's the biggest hesitancy. Um, I forgot what the second question was. So if um, Dr. James, if you have something to to add, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. 
I, I certainly think that uh, the uh, I, I always encourage skepticism with, with my learners, and that's why I'm happy, super happy to hear Max say, you know, he's very uh, skeptical. I, I really appreciate that. It's the cynicism part that I, I often have the the trouble with, uh, and and I think some of that has to do with uh, unfamiliarity or lack of familiarity with uh, with what AI and machine learning um, can be, uh, and to some extent, uh, what it is. Um, I think the overhype part or piece uh, becomes a, a bit of an issue. Just thinking a bit more broadly, you know, you hear about things like, you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning is going to replace this specialist, or it's going to replace this specialist, and so on. And I think hearing about that that can be pretty frightening to some, you know. But but I think that as we learn more about what AI and and and, and machine learning are, um, it, it allows us to be a, a bit less uh, cynical and to actually appreciate. Uh, that these uh, technologies are meant to work for us and ultimately for our patients. Thank you all. So we have about two minutes left. Um, so I'm going to give everyone an opportunity to um, just say some last words. Is there anything we didn't cover today that you think is really, really important that we, um, you know, say to our audience? And, and I'm going to also ask you to put your crystal ball on. Uh, get it out and tell me if there's a game changer in this space that we should be thinking about. So one thing that I would want to say sort of as <laughs> final words is that we haven't really talked necessarily about the role that um, AI would play in um, healthcare in various places in the world, right? So speaking of global health, and one statement that really stuck with me from um, last year when we had a symposium, we had a mix of clinician and AI um, experts. And somebody said that fear of AI is a first world problem. And I really thought about that. And I, I do think it's true to a large extent. Obviously we have to carefully consider all the pros and cons, what are the implications, biases, and so forth. Um, but ultimately, there are a lot of places in this world that do not have, for instance, the example that was brought up was rad um, radiologist in India. And there are many other such examples. And so really, there are many places where AI can actually make the whole difference. So it's an either you have it or else you don't really get the radiography. And so keeping in mind the whole world, as opposed to our isolated cases, uh, when we make decisions of how to use AI or whether to move forward. And um, I think that's, that's very important. Any last thoughts? I think um, it's a very exciting place to be in. There's a lot of challenges, um, but I, I'm, I think I'm sanguine in general and not sanguine in like the AI is gonna take over the world and it's gonna totally reshape medicine. But I think that we're sort of in the like long haul slog place where slowly we're gonna start to actually understand like what is, what is the real value that this provides? How should physicians and other clinicians really think about using these things? How do we properly implement these things? How do we not use them as like bludgeons of socio-technical like systems, um, but actually use them to like enhance workflows? So I'm, I'm very excited about, you know, how do we actually like marry the technical side with the workflow side? And so my, my, um, my home airport is Madison, Wisconsin. And there's an EHR vendor there. And I was just visiting my family for uh, Thanksgiving. And there's tons of ads for all these like new clinical experience um, software, like essentially AI systems that will help physicians be able to do documentation a little bit easier by listening to the patient conversation. And I think that's probably, there's a bunch of problems with that, but I'm excited with the general idea that we can think about like, how do we make workflow easier? How do we make actually practicing medicine easier? How do we potentially reduce burnout by using these systems? So that's one of the one of the things that I'm excited and looking forward to in the next you know decade plus. Great. I want to thank everyone. Uh, today I want to apologize to the people who 
people whose questions we were unable to answer today. I'm sure our panelists would be happy to um, receive an email. I'm going to volunteer. I'm not. I won't give your emails out, but I will say if if, if there's someone has a burning question um, that they want answered, um, um, I'm sure our speakers would be happy to further engage that. Um, I want to thank everyone for attending. Um, today was recorded and you will be receiving a link um, with a, a recording of the webinar. The, that recording will also include, uh, include closed captioning um, for those that needed closed captioning today. I'm, I'm truly uh, sorry that we didn't have it for this webinar. But again, I want to thank everyone for their work today. And in particular, I want to thank Tina Crazier from Precision Health for helping us plan this series and, and being our kind of behind the scenes um, person. And I look forward to seeing everyone in late January um, when we'll be discussing some of the legal um, and ethical issues associated with AI and machine learning in healthcare. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.